Hi and welcome to this sixth lecture in this series on digital forensics and I can actually tell you that in the last video we reached just about an hour over an hour of uh, you listening to my wonderful voice and if you don't like it then what are you doing here so well trying to be funny failing hard Okay, so for this lecture by me, Joachim Chevrestad, lecturer at the University of Skövde, we're going to talk about the actual forensic analysis. Uh, up until here, we had a quick overlook on what digital forensics is, uh, in what crimes digital forensics is interesting, some computer ba theory background that's important in this field, and during the last two lectures, we talked about gathering uh, evidence, uh, some techniques or some steps that you're going to take and some of the considerations. Remember that you have to have a write blocker when you, uh, preferably at least, so that you don't contaminate the evidence. If you have to do a live investigation or if you have a chance to, you have to document everything and you have to collect some volatile data before you do a disk image and then you do some other more dangerous tasks before you do the disk image and so on and so forth. But uh, it actually comes a time when you collected the evidence, you have your forensic image, which is a copy of the hard drive that you're set to examine or uh, some other storage de device, and then comes the forensic process where you actually do the analysis. So a forensic examination is basically the process where you take your disk image and you use the find information on there and you use the information to answer some question. Uh, and before we go into a process for doing the analysis, uh, I want to tell you that a forensic examination as it's at its core is about answering questions that is asked by someone else. You wouldn't do a forensic examination for the fun of it, uh, or, well, maybe you would, but most commonly you would do it because an investigator or your boss or supervisor tells you that you should do it, and you do it for a reason. So. Uh, in a criminal setting, you do it to uncover if someone committed a crime or, or not, or you may do it because uh, in a corporate environment you were you found a virus or you were attacked by someone or something. Uh, the common idea, however, is to uncover what the computer has been used to do. You are, by, by examining the data on a hard drive, you try to recreate or trace what the computer was up to, and this is in order to prove or disapprove something. Uh, and it becomes obvious when you start looking at examples. Take the narcotics example, for, for instance. You want to prove or disprove that a computer was used to sell drugs. Uh, in order to do that, you find uh, a bit of steps. Maybe uh, one guess is that a computer was out on darknet. It, then you want to prove or disprove that the computer was out on darknet. Maybe Tor browser is installed on the computer, which is evidence that a computer has actually been used to search the darknet, or at least it could. Um, in another setting, you may want to disprove that a computer was remote mode controlled. Uh, the suspect said, hey, well, there's a lot of evidence on my computer, but that must have been put there by my friend who remote co mode controlled my computer using TeamViewer. So you go look and look and look and look, but you find nothing referring to TeamViewer whatsoever, and therefore you can uh, disapprove that theory, or at least say that that theory is not very likely, because there isn't a single trace on, of TeamViewer on this computer. Um, looking at some of the constraints or some of the requirements on a forensic examination, first of all, it must be unbiased. Uh, and this is actually quite hard, but you have to understand when you're a forensic expert that when you're examining something, your role is to be objective. You're going to put, put forth the facts. Um, and that becomes... Uh, clear when you're working on an examination, maybe someone is uh, suspected of child pornography or having child pornography, it's quite easy to go into the role of looking actively for incriminating evidence. That's what you want to find. You want to get that bastard. Uh, and you shouldn't do that. Rather, you should look at a computer and say, well, here is some evidence that says that the computer was used to find child pornography, and here is evidence that state the opposite. The sum of those two becomes, well, something, and you have to be objective. So if, if the computer was used to find child pornography, of course your conclusion should be that, but you have to make sure that you're unbiased. And you have to understand in this case that when you surf the internet, things get into your computer. I mean, if you surf uh, some strange forum, uh, in Sweden we have flashback, uh, or maybe you go into the Pirate Bay, you have those ads at the side where there is uh, uh, strange pornography or strange other messages that's 
actually being displayed on the computer. And since it's being displayed on the computer, it's likely to be placed in the computer memory and it may even be placed in some temporary internet files. So that's something that you understand because the, that you have to understand because this is something that is happening without the computer user being actively looking for porn. Um, and for that reason, it's very important that when you encounter something, you look at it in an unbiased way. So, for instance, if you're looking for traces of, well, someone, some, you, you, you're looking for, you're doing a murder case and you're looking for something that speaks in favor of, uh, of the suspect or the owner of the computer hating someone. And you notice that he's been on a forum where, well, hating... Uh, who are we going to use? Is Trump okay? So hating Trump is stated on this forum. That doesn't mean that means that hating Trump will be placed in the suspect's computer. And when you find hating Trump in temporary internet files, what should your conclusion be? Well, basically nothing because it's in temporary internet files. It's being downloaded from some forum automatically. It doesn't say anything about the suspect's view on Trump. So the first requirement for a forensic examination is that it's totally unbiased. We want objective facts. Uh, next thing is that it should be reproducible. And that, com that basically comes down to your method and your reporting. What you're doing, when you're doing your forensic examination, I should be able to look at your protocol, take the same piece of evidence, the same hard drive, do the same thing and get the same results. That's how we know that the facts hold true uh, and the, the, fa the facts are strong. Uh, this unbiasedness and reproducible, uh, reproducibility can, uh, in many aspects, be com uh, compared to a scientific study where the same re uh, requirements sort of apply for it if, in order to be able to say that the results are strong. If someone is doing the same thing as you, they should get the same data as you and they should in turn come to the same conclusion as you. That's how we know that, know that a forensic examination is good. And this is what the court will finally uh, require of you if you have to co go witness in court. Uh, final, final step, of course, final uh, regulation uh, or requirement is that your forensic examination has to comply with local laws and regulations. And I can tell you now, and it's very true, laws and regulations are so different in different countries. Uh, I'm so happy that I work in Sweden because when I do a house search in Sweden, uh, I get a house a search warrant for a house. Uh, some prosecutor is telling me to go search this house and I can basically take whatever I want from that house that uh, that can be used as evidence within re with reason, of course. But on contrary, I've heard that in the U.S., for example, you can get a search warrant for a specific uh, computer, uh, and you find another computer. You have to call the prosecutor again and say, "Can I take this other computer?" Uh, and the prosecutor may say, "No." You e may even get a search warrant that's only valid for a certain user on a computer. How easy is that? Uh, so, uh, anyhow, a forensic examination must, of course, comply with local laws. Uh, but you should know that this goes mainly for criminal investigations. In a corporate environment, the requirements may be more loose and, honestly, is often more loose. So, okay, with that said, uh, we now know that a forensic uh, analysis is about uh, finding data on a hard drive or some carrier of information and use that to answer questions. Uh, and uh, to uh, try to abstract this a little bit more, this uh, entire process, I made a model, beginning with getting an understanding of the case and analyzing the questions asked or the purpose to create objectives. Because every so often you get um, you get a note from an investigator saying, well, this computer was seized during a drug raid. Uh, we want to see if there's any drugs here. And well, the, the, the bad answer to that would be, no, it's a computer. There's not going to be any drugs on it. Uh, but the more uh, the smarter way to go would be to read on the case, uh, see the case report, maybe read interrogations, to see, to see well, what's about what what's this case about? Who is the suspect, and what do you actually want? Uh, is it about some guy selling drugs on the corner? Well, then maybe you want a list of phone number. You may want the phone number to his drug supervisor. You may want the phone records to the people that he sold drugs to. That's your objectives. Uh, maybe it's about uh, child pornography and some guy is suspected of uh, sharing a lot of sh uh, child pornography. Well, then your objectives become uh, well, locating child pornography. Uh, locating maybe chat history about uh, sharing child pornography. What, what do I know? 
the first two steps at least is to understand the case, analyze the questions that you're asked, and boil all this down to the objectives, to your objectives. Um, when that is done, you go into finding basic information. You should have a process for finding some basic computer information that you do in every single ca case, like uh, operating system version, users, and so on and so forth. And when that's done, you go on to finding information relating to your objectives. Analyze that ob objectives and draw conclusion, and then summarize it all in the report. Now, we're going to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, so, as I said, before you get going, you should spend some time understanding the case. And I'm spending quite a lot of time talking about this because it's very important. Uh, I've seen several forensic experts that's just dug into the computers. And the result is often quite good, or quite good in the sense that I find a lot of information. Uh, so, uh, so the prosecutor says, this is a drug case, here's the computer, go... Uh, go find something and the forensic expert starts diving in and he finds uh, a list of all the suspects friends a list of all the suspects emails he finds a lot of files he finds that the suspects been googling narcotics over time and time again but uh, at the boiling point there was only one telephone number that a prosecutor was interested in um, and that's not very good. So understand what you're looking for, understand the case. And uh, as I said, this can involve reading the case description, reading interrogation reports, analyzing the objectives or the questions that you were asked, but maybe most importantly, discuss with the investigator, ask him what are you actually expecting from this. Uh, I've even seen cases where, you know, it's about your time as well as everyone else's. I've seen cases or I've had cases where I've been handed like five five computers and 20 cell phones and they were all taken from someone who was was arrested for a house break and I'm I mean I can tell you without even looking at the computers that there's not going to be anything here so what I, do I do well in the beginning of my career career I started looking through all the computers and then after spending a month doing that I could I understood that there was not no information there and uh, uh, a few months in uh, into my forensic career, I started asking the investigators, what do you expect? And they were like, eh, I don't know. And then I go, well, then I'm not sure that I'm going to look at him. Come back when you know what you want. Uh, anyway, the result, the list of objectives, that's describing what you're going to look for during your examination. And do not skip this step. Uh, next then, finding basic information, and this is something that I've been sloppy with a couple of times, and I can tell you that when you get to court and you're asked the question, what operating system was there on the computer, and you go like, hmm, I don't know, and then you get the famous question, what else did you miss? And, uh, and then you're probably lost, and everyone in court has already decided that you're a bad forensic expert. Or, or what about when you get a question, how many gigabytes big was the hard drive? And, and you're like, hmm, it was 250. And the next question is, was all space partitioned? And then you're like, uh, I don't know. And then the next question was, is it possible that there was a lot of data on the hard drive that you skipped? And then you're forced to say yes, and then you're the bad guy. So finding basic information is good. Uh, not least to save your own ass and finding basic information should begin with accounting for for all data meaning that you examine the physical size of the hard drives that you're looking at or the storage devices that you're looking at and then you go look at how much of that space that's actually allocated to a visible partition so if you have a 250 gigabyte hard drive and you find that there is 100 uh, one partition of 100 gigabytes and then there is another of 120 gigabytes then there is 30 gigabytes left and then you have to Go into go looking into what happened to that data, uh, and then instead of saying I don't know, when uh, when the attorney asks you uh, if you looked at all the data, then you can say Yeah, I did. There was actually a hidden partition where all the evidence was. How about that? Uh, next thing that's good to get is the computer install date, operating system version, list of users, and the registered owner. Uh, and this is basically so you can basically easily answer questions about what operating system the computer used, how many users there was, uh, and the registered owner. I mean, that's wonderful. When you install Windows, you, or you usually get a question about what your name is, and you usually fill it out. Even criminal fill, uh, criminals fill it out, so oftentimes the suspects say, well, that's not my computer, and 
then you can say, well, then why is your name the registered owner? And then they will go, oh, that's not good. Uh, next piece of information that you will want to get is the time zone information and clock settings that were for, for the computer. And that is basically for the sole reason that time is commonly an, an important factor. Uh, maybe there is a case where I've actually had cases where the suspect said, well, but if you look at the timestamps here, you you said that I sent an email at uh, 5th of November at 5 a.m. And then, uh, then they go like, I wasn't even in Sweden then, or I wasn't even at home. You can see here, you can see here that I had a plane ticket to get to, I don't know, Washington or whatever. And uh, then you can say, but but when I analyzed your time zone information and your clock settings, I could see that your your computer was set to use a time zone in uh, Azerbaijan and the clock settings was off by five days. So taking that in consideration, you actually, you was home and you sent the email. Now you can go to jail. Uh, the final piece on my list, you can of course add as much as you want, but I strongly encourage you to look for network drive maps. Uh, and the network drive map is basically a drive letter. You know, in Windows, you have your C colon drive. Um, and you can, but you can also give drive letters like, uh, to remote uh, network drives that are located somewhere else. So you can say, like, well, maybe F colon is some USB drive and Z colon is some, uh, some network drive. And if you analyze those drive maps, you can understand if the computer has been connected to remote storage devices. And that will, well, maybe tell the prosecutors to go back look for something else or maybe it will give you an indication that uh, that the storage server that he seized was actually connected to the computer and that's good to know. Uh, so for the actual actual analysis then this becomes the shortest slide because it's about looking for artifacts concerning the objectives of your examination and this is where your forensic skills comes into play because I cannot stand here telling you what to look for in your specific case because it depends on what your case is about. Uh, I would guess on top of my hand that if you're looking for chat messages there is 20, 2500 different chat clients that you can analyze all in the their different ways. Uh, if you're looking for something that's concerning child pornography and sharing of child pornography I can tell you that there is a bunch of different clients that you can use to share files. Uh, Emu, uh, Direct Connect, Casa Lineware, if those are still there, and Skype, MSN, and so on and so forth. So the actual analysis is looking for artifacts that's concerning the objectives of your examination, and you actually have to, well, examine your computer and see where it takes you, because, well, look for what's there and we will get a little get back to this a little bit uh, on how you to how you see what applications that was installed and some of the common places where you can find application data in in a later lecture but basically you're going to analyze the artifacts that you find here and you will use that information to draw your conclusions and note here that there might be it may be interesting to include some external information when you draw your conclusions i mean um for example, you, you may want to lean on something that a suspect said. As I said in the beginning, one part of an examination may be to uh, to deduce whether or not a computer was remote controlled using TeamViewer. And then a conclusion would be uh, something like uh, the suspect said that the computer was remote controlled using TeamViewer. Since TeamViewer is not, not installed on the computer, that's unlikely. Uh, finally, you'll summarize your findings and conclusions into a report, and that's what we're going to discuss next. Uh, with that said, thank you for your attention. Questions in the comments field. Bye.